tonight. And now it's my pleasure to do the introduction for Paula. More notes, Paula's from Napoli, where she did her first degree, um, and then moved to London for a while, where she studied at the Courtauld and worked on important projects at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Then she was back in Napoli to do a PhD. And then she moved off to New York, where she worked several years at the Metropolitan Art Museum uh, before moving on up to Yale for the University Art Museum, an important curating role up there. And eventually, uh, Italy hunted the back again to come uh, and run the Bargello Museum Group here in Florence. And so it's a huge, huge pleasure that I welcome Paolo Bacostino to the Vision City Florence. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Simon Gammel, for the invitation. And he left me free to choose which one of my museums, so to speak, I wanted to talk about tonight. And I chose Palazzo d'Avanzati not only because it's one of the five that has been recently refurbished and was closed for eight months last year, but also because it has a series of special connections, both with the Anglo-American community here in Florence in the late 19th century and early 20th century, and more recently, about a century ago, with the um, uh, trade of art in between Florence and United States. Currently, uh, as you probably know right now, although I'm the director of the Musei del Bargello, I oversee five institutions. And this is important for tonight's topic because the headquarter is of course the Museo Nazionale del Bargello, which you probably know was the first national museum established when Florence was the capital. So it opened its door in May of 1865 followed by the Medici chapels and Or San Michele, Casa Martelli and Palazzo d'Avanzati. In any other city outside of Florence, Palazzo d'Avanzati would be one of the principal attraction because of its architecture, because of its peculiar history and because of its collections. But since its acquisition by the Italian state, it has always been placed in the category of the so-called minor museums and somehow has always had this kind of like third rate interest in the tourist trucks that come to Florence. It has had the privilege of having a unique history that somehow, as I hope I will explain during our conversation, which I aim will it inspire you to go and visit if you have not been, or revisit if you have been Palazzo d'Avanzati. Um, it has had a very strange history within the fabric of the city of Florence, which to today modern viewer is not immediately apparent. When you enter the building, you cross the loggia and you are in a pleasant courtyard which immediately is reminiscent of Escher etchings with its medieval uh, staircase winding up to the fourth story. In fact, Palazzo d'Avanzati, and I show you here a very rare image of uh, one of the albums of the early 20th century, is one of the few standing uh, in the historic city of Florence, so-called Casa Torre tower houses, houses, and it was uh, saved by what was called the modernization of, the, of Florence during Poggi works that interested all of the city center and close by Piazza della Repubblica because of the claim of many Anglo-American residents in Florence, which were horrified um, by the transformation and modernization of the Florence urban fabric. And it was something that if you put in the history of the reunification, reunified Italy was very common. It happened in Florence, in Milan, in Rome, in Naples, but for the Anglo-American community, it was especially crucial 
in Florence not to alter the sort of like medieval little street and little alley. And what we did, what you see here is a gate that still exists that brings you into one of the little alleys that still has medieval um, arches above. And it's a very unique standing um, aspect of the architecture in Florence. When it was decided not to turn it down, one of the people who had a very important role was Violet Page Vernon Lee, who in 1898 wrote a very um, strong letter advocating for uh, Palazzo d'Avanzati not to be turned down. It was saved, but it was empty until a man called Elia Volpi, whom you see here in the bottom right, decided to acquire it for 62,000 Italian lira and work very eagerly for six years to its conservation, to its restoration work, and hired a series of architects, conservators, and um, craftsmen to render the idea of what I'll tell you in a moment, but what the reason why I am showing you here, together with a portrait of Volpi, an, another museum which you may or may not recognize, but it's another somehow counterpoint to Palazzo d'Avanzati, and is the Museo Bardini. As if you have not seen, I really recommend you to go and visit this unique museum that is like stepping back in the era of the very rich. Uh, dealers uh, living and working in Florence and Stefano Bardini was called the Prince of the Dealers and he was renowned worldwide. But what is unique of Palazzo d'Avanzati compared to many other museums that are in Florence and which you probably have visited, the Horn Museums, the Stibert Museums, Villa La Pietra, in a certain way, Villa Itati, is that the Horn, the Seabird, and the Bardini Museum itself were left by their owners to the city of Florence, or in the case of Itati, Bernard Berenson left it to Harvard with very specific ties. Palazzo d'Avanzati belongs to the state, the Italian state, for a very peculiar series of reasons, which I hope I will unveil you tonight. But it's also because Palazzo d'Avanzati itself, when it was completed and reopened its door to the public, was already, there is a special procedure in Italy that says when a building is notified or a collection is notified, which means that it's of special interest to the Italian state and it cannot be altered or it cannot be sold unless the Italian state is informed. And at the time, it was very important. You have to think that in 1910, there were, there were the first um, regulations that were set in place in terms of cultural heritage, but it was not until 1939 that the very first law in terms of protection of Italian works of art and rules were set into place, both for monumental, uh, buildings as well as movable artworks. When it opened its door, it was a success, a tremendous success. Elia Wolpe had trained first as an artist. He tried to be a painter in late 19th century. He studied at the um, Accademia di Belle Arti. He was born in 1858, uh, but when he realized that he was not going to be an outstanding artist, join the workshop and uh, business of Stefano Bardini work, work, work for him, especially as a restorer, and work with him learning the trade, the secret of the trade. And Bardini had among his clients the most prominent American uh, private collectors, Morgan, uh, Rockefeller, um, but also important museum collection directors outside of Italy. Billion Bode was one of the frequent visitors and he is the founder of many 
of, and of the acquisitions that were made by Germany in the early 20th century. And Bode modeled his own Bode museums of the sculpture collection in Berlin, looking at the Bardini collection, which had been modeled according to the display at the Bargello. So somehow the museums group as this kind of like trade among medieval and museums business between late 19th century and early 20th century. Volpi had also decided to set his business there. So it was a museum that had opened to the public that the king had visited. Morgan and others were among his first visitors, but he also had this incredible uh, mar successfully marketing idea of having a 14th century building being the house for his dealing shop in a different way from what Bardini had done because it was, uh, of course, uh, um, an antique building, but it didn't have the uniqueness of Palazzo d'Avanzati allure. So what Volpi did was to acquire a series of artworks, decorative arts, furniture, um, tapestries, paintings, and display them onto these four floors following uh, a book that had been published in the early uh, 1910s uh, by Attilio Caparelli, who was very much in connection and in dialogue with Elia Volpi. And they both worked on this idea of how an old medieval Florentine residence would have looked like and what you needed to have in your collection to resemble that in terms of chairs, carpet, and furnishing, and others. And it was such a successful idea that it became very popular among decorators overseas. So many residences in London, uh, in New York especially, but also in Florida and in California were furnished taking as a model the rooms of Palazzo d'Avanzati, not only in terms of their um, furnishings, but also replicating some of the rooms I'll show you in a moment. I wanted to take a look to this specific uh, piece of furniture, which is an armor cabinet, which you see now in the 1916th century, uh, in 1910 photographs, but you'll see later on in the new display and as a very peculiar collecting stories. Elia Volpi furnished with beds and he did a very fine work of restoring the wall paintings, which are very unique uh, because they were, we don't have many examples in Florence that survive and are typical of a sort of like merchant residence of the 14th century and 14th and 15th century. Most of the paintings are of the 15th century. This is the peacock room, which you'll see in a moment in a detailing color. And what is intriguing, and it's very important to place it in the con context. And for that, there was a very important article by Patrizia Capellini, who has studied very deeply Wolpi. And I will mention a few names of art historians who had paid particular attention, not to sort of like tell bibliography by heart, but because it's very important to me to understand that Palazzo d'Aranzati has been for over a century, a very interesting topic from an academic point of view. And all its directors who work on the installation tried at different time to resonate this very peculiar story which we had to retell, as you'll see, towards the end of my presentation. And by the end, you'll have to tell me if we were as successful as the one who came before us. Um, what was interesting, and what you may know or not know, but I'll, I'll bring your attention to, is that it was very common towards the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century to strip frescoes to take frescoes off the wall, place them. It started as a conservation policy, and there are many street frescoes at Uffizi, for example. If you go, uh, you find many, and 
illustrious examples by Botticelli and others. And many of these were then sold. One of the most um, famous examples is the Strips fresco by Botticelli that ended up at the Louvre and Bardini was part of this. Now, I'm telling you this because Volpi sometimes worked with the Bardini entourage to do this kind of operations. And sometimes there were um, critiques by members of the then Ministry of Culture. What is interesting is that at Palazzo d'Avanzati, he decided to leave it exactly as it was. And rather than modify or take some of the relevant parts for trade, he had this idea of preserving the site as much as he could. So somehow, in his own way, although it was, of course, a trading interest, there was already the idea of the importance of preservation of mural paintings where they were made. So this is a detail of the peacock room that you saw in black and white. And what is also interesting is that we have to thank Alia Volpi who worked on the conservation of the wooden beams. Now it's something that you couldn't see very much before because it was the, the lighting was much more tuned in before the reinstallation to the medieval lighting. We decided to have a mix of lighting system and now and to lead this incredible wooden roof, which are in, very rare and which still bears the um, coat of arms of the Davizi family, and then later on of the Davanzati. What is also intriguing about the mural painting of Davanzati is that they are very much into the style of a merchant residence, of the people who actually lived in. So in the peacock rooms, you have a series of coat of arms that have been systematically studied, and that, that proves that the Davizi family had ties with the Angevin families, they traded abroad, and all of this for people who study heraldry is immediately apparent. So it was this combination of fake tapestries, which you see below, with this idea almost of a trompe of a wooden uh, bar from which the paintings are hanging, and, and this sort of like fake loggia into um, the outdoors with this combination of birds and vegetable uh, decorative motifs, but also a very specific decorative programs in terms of heraldry. It is thanks to Elia Volpi that he had this idea to setting up a kitchen on the third floor, which to this day, to this day is one of the most um, liked rooms by the public and with this idea that you can actually pick in what they used to cook in the 15th century and 16th century and he even set up we didn't a sort of like a tablecloth with all the things you needed to use for eating he had a very good business from 1910 through 1916 and he he had also um an idea. War struck, as you know, in 1915. There were difficulties, and he organized, starting in 1915, the export of all the movable objects from Palazzo d'Avanzati to New York, and had two auctions, two memorable auctions, in 1916 and in 1917, where he sold almost everything. Very few objects were stocked before and acquired by the Italian state. Everything else left. And the, the sun was incredible. This bed, which you see, was in one of the bedrooms in Palazzo d'Avanzati, landed in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it was exhibited as an original 15th century bed in one of the period rooms arranged at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Then doubts aroused and in preparation for a very important and unique show, which I hope some of you have seen, if not, go and look for the catalog, organized at the VNA was called At Home in the Renaissance. 
It was a groundbreaking exhibition, not only for the scope of the show itself, but also for what it entailed in terms of research for the show and scouting of the collection worldwide. So they wanted to borrow the bed. <laughs> and they sent uh, experts, which you probably have met, but I like to mention them because they were Italians. Because the problem is, it's very hard to understand this furniture because sometimes it was real forgery. Like the intention was to create a piece in the style of. Other times was conservation of damaged pieces of furniture that they adjusted. So Simone Chiarudi and Fausto Calderai went to the Metropolitan and gave the staff the sad news that it was actually a fake. So it's still in the storage, but it's no longer on view. But there were incredible masterpieces, things that you would not think of. I made a selection of the very unusual one because they are not typically Florentine. I'm not showing you Verrocchio, Botticelli, Ghiberti, so on and so forth. But the Metropolitan Museum has in the Lehman collection, this beautiful Francia, which is the Virgin and Child with St. Francis and St. Jerome that was acquired at the auction and through different owners ended up into the Lehman collection, which is now part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and a beautiful portrait of a man by Moretto. This is to tell you that really Florence was the crossroads of the dealing business, not only of Florent, proper Florentine art, but also of Italian art. And that these two paintings were probably in some rooms of Palazzo d'Avanzati and then left and went to New York. I'm also showing you um, a painting, a drawing, preserved, kept at the Detroit Institute of Art, and is a woman in a Florentine interiors. It's 1908, but it gives you the sense of how Palazzo d'Avanzati was really seen as the role model of a Florentine residence. And it was through this narrative that Elia Volpi re reopened the palace in 1920, after the war, started the business again, until disaster stroke. And I'm only making a brief mention because it's not um, the subject of tonight's topic, but it would deserve a specific conference. And it's the business of Alceo Dossena. Some of you may know that Alceo Dossena was a forger, and he carved a series of marble statues that were sold to the major American museums uh, in the style of Rossellino, Donatello, Desiderio, mostly to American museums and to some very important one, and especially to Detroit. So where it was proved that these were forgeries and Elia Volpi had sold some of this, he had to repay the sum and it meant that he went bankrupt. So he sold Palazzo d'Avanzati to another dealer an Egyptian, Egyptian brothers called the Bengujat brothers. And I'm showing you this image because they decided to open um, a different cloister on the underground floor, which we cannot open to the public because of safety reasons, but it was a very unique courtyard where they had their own display they pretty much remodeled what Volpi had done. So this idea of the Florentine room had somehow become so rooted that even with passing through different owners, the style remained the same. So furnishing, and they expanded to some Islamic objects too, which they sold. In the end, Palazzo d'Avanzati was sold again in less than 10 centuries to the Spanish galleries. It closed down. It was going into ruin in 1951. And this is also very important. So it was less than 10 years after the war. You have to think how Florence was damaged during the war, bombed. So the Italian state stepped in to save Palazzo d'Avanzati, had an amazing restoration campaign, and it reopened to the public in 1951. 
And I love to show you these black and white images because Bertie, who was his first director, wrote a catalog of what he had done and a story published uh, in 1959, the Palazzo d'Avanzati reopened in 1956. And it was the first time, it was in the um, um, collection of books funded by the Casa di Risparmio for the small museum. So it already opened its door and was already labeled as a small, as a small museum. But it was the interest of Berti to the architecture and to preserving what Elia Volpi had done. And I love this detail of um, medieval capital with different faces that some people believe, I don't, but some people believe may be the portrait of the Davizzi family. Berti also did a very careful documentation by photographic uh, singular pieces of along this corridor, which you see through the well. And I like this photo because it gives you the sense of how uh, really you go into every medieval corner of the building. At some point, Palazzo d'Avanzati became the office of the Catasto, which is, I can you say, real estate registry, something like that. Yes. Um, so the, the hypothesis, but it's something that we want to study again, is that all this writing, so we have also medieval writers along the walls of Palazzo d'Avanzati with little portraits, some of money, uh, musical notes, and this big inscription in the kitchen, which I will read you in a moment, were done by people waiting in the public office. So there have been different campaigns made by different <clears throat> scholars and paleographers in 1977, they did the transcription of many of them. And according to many specialists, it is mostly original. We are now starting a new collaboration with the University of Florence and the University of Chieti to do the transcriptions again, study and understand how much was original, how much was half original, half made up by Elia Volpi, and if possible, what went lost during the conservation campaign. In the kitchen, on the third floor, when you go and visit, it says, Adi 26 Aprile, fu morto Giuliano dei Medici in Santa Maria. So it almost seems like a newsletter saying, and it's very high. So the style of the writing, I've been told, is consistent with the time. But the more people study it, the more they have doubts. So I hope that one way or another, they will come out with a, an answer. Then in 1999, Palazzo d'Avanzati had to close for very important static campaign, conservation campaign. And it had a very important director called Rosanna Protopisani, who really worked and fought to have Palazzo d'Avanzati reopen its door in 2009. And these are some of the images of her redisplay of works and her idea of keeping the idea of Berti and Volpi in reconstructing the Antica Casa Fiorentina. This is the famous parrot room. And this is one of the Madornali, they are called, they are the big, uh, representing rooms, and they are very unique for the way in which they were preserved, but also for the state of their ceilings. And it's very important to bear in mind that we are talking of a building that was created in the middle of the 14th century. In 2016, when I was uh, starting my job as director, we started with the former directors, Brunella Teodori and the curator Jennifer Celani to rethink how Elia Volpi could really come to life and what people would expect when they were visiting Palazzo d'Avanzati. There was an application made to the ministry and there was uh, extra funded, funding given to Palazzo d'Avanzati for the refurbishing of the old building and for the refurbishing and redisplay 
of the laces collection. In 2019, um, a new curator arrived, Daniele Rapino, who recently retired, and I'm very grateful to him for his incredible work, not only in having the courage to put his hand to one of the small museums of Florence, but one of the most loved ones by the Florentine people, for reason that I'll tell you in a while, um, to find the right, strike the right balance with the architect and designer Lorenzo Gretti in keeping the style of the Casa Fiorentina, but also in creating a more coherent museum uh, display and giving a story of very specific objects and periods that were involved and intertwined with his story. So when you, he decided to, oops, yes. He decided that Elia Volpi deserved more than just a video telling the story. And there were two rooms devoted to the story of him as a collector and the story of him when he envisaged the idea of Palazzo d'Avanzati and the family of Elia Volpi was very generous with the museum. They donated the collection of paintings by Elia Volpi and a series of documents that have been instrumental for scholars, but also for museum staff to reconstruct this very unique story of art preservation and trade. So two rooms guide you in understanding what was the Florentine climate at the time, what he meant to do with the Museo della Casa Fiorentina, but, but Daniele Rapino was also very um, intelligent in re-establishing what Berti had done. So a sequence of chronological sequence between 14th and 15th century on the first floor, 16th and, sec 16th and 17th century on the second floor, and then create the third floor with a very specific differentiation, which we'll go through. So on the first floor, there was a redisplay of the objects, and you have more or less the idea of, of how sparse, in a way, the furbishing was during the Middle Age. And then he created what he called three intellectual islands in the museum display. The first one is devoted to a very unique, but incredibly difficult to show and to make appreciate quilt. It's called the Guicciardini quilt, and it had been acquired at the auction in 1916 and destined to the Bargello Museums. And then when Berti reopened the Davanzati, it displayed it at the Davanzati, but it's so frail. It's a middle 14th century embroidery. And it's called Guicciardini because it was commissioned by the, Guicciardi, the Florentine Guicciardini family. And the only person who saw it together with its companion, which is now on view at the Victoria and Albert Museum in the medieval galleries, was not an art historian, but a philologist called Pio Raina, who wrote in 1912 a very important article on the story and the unique um, the, uh, um, uniqueness of this place, which tells the story of Tristan and Isolde, but in Sicilian and not in Florentine. So there is still a puzzle whether it was commissioned by the Guicciardini family for someone in Sicily or whether it was vice versa, made in Sicily on the commission of the Guicciardini family. And on that, this Saturday, we will have a professor, a Sicilian professor of Romance philology, delivering a lecture on this topic and trying to reconstruct the connection between poetry, art, trade, and the importance of Florentine patrons in disseminating, as we'll see in a moment in Palazzo d'Avanzati as well, French uh, poetry. So in this room, when you visit, you'll find the original in this case, which was made specifically for this quilt, um, a facsimile, which we decided to display so that people can really 
appreciate the texture of it. And then it was thanks to funding from the Casa di Risparmio that we had created a short video by a um, director called Gianmarco D'Agostino, and there are no connections, um, who won a lot of festival for children's short films. And it's a, there is a two parts. One is devoted more to children to explain the story, and another reconstruct the connection between our quilt and the one uh, preserved in London. On the other side of the room, for the first time, there are a series of objects related to either, either the um, knight's outfit or the Guicciardini family that comes mostly from the storage of the Museo Nazionale del Bardello and were never on display before. So there was also this important collaboration among different museum staff members to really bring to light objects that are not in obviously on display. The second room, and you may remember on the second floor, is devoted to the weapon cabinet. Now, you would think that this object stayed in the Volpi um, collection and was given to the state with the building. No, it was sold at the auction of 1916. It was in a private collection. And when the owner saw that Palazzo d'Avanzati was going to become a state museum, the heir of the people who had purchased it in 1916 donated to Palazzo d'Avanzati. And I find it a very moving story, not only in terms of attention to the importance of the collection and the building, but also it's a Sienese early 16th century piece with a very intriguing and very refined candelabra motif that has been very deeply studied and there has been some analysis. And again, on this round, thinking of what Elia Volpi had done in the image I showed you a little earlier, some um, weapons and armors from the Museo Nazionale del Bargello were again put on display. And this room was all devoted to what it meant to be a knight in the 16th century with this beautiful shield um, that was probably Lombard and again comes from the Museo Nazionale del Bargello. And then we come to probably one of the famous pieces of Davanzati. And when I told you about strip painting and strip fresco, this is the most complete cycle of the Châtelaine de Brigitte, which was a very famous French uh, poetry um, love story that we know of in many illuminated manuscripts, ivories, but always by anecdote. Here you have the whole cycle of unhappy love. I won't go into each detail of the story, but this was commissioned by the Davizzi family on the occasion of um, a wedding of a member of their family. And it's intriguing because it shows the very close ties of the family with the French world, because of course there was trade, but also the importance of the cycle and the importance of Volpi there is not even in France a, 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 as complete as this cycle with every single scene. And Volpi at the time could have easily decided to strip apart and sell it and decided to keep it all together, which I think is very um, unique of the time. The other new room, so to speak, is the room devoted to Skeja and is on the third floor in the so-called impannate room. And again, you see the decorative museum, the decorative motif of the wall is consistent with the rest of the other rooms. And there is this differentiation. Um, the rooms that have paintings are the rooms at the back that were most probably bedrooms. And on each floor, you have a bedroom and a painted room. In the progression of the new display, the first room, uh, the first floor and the second floor are still bedrooms. On the third floor, we decided to break the uh, rule, so to speak, and devote a room to this very peculiar artist who was the younger brother of Masaccio. And today, nowadays is considered a minor artist, just like a minor museum. But at the time, 
was a very prominent artist and he was the painter of the Medici, of the house of the Medici. He, his collection is scattered in between the Galleria dell'Accademia, di Uffizi and Palazzo d'Avanzati. And he also has a series of important paintings abroad. None of them is as curious as this for panel painting, which are curved. And no one to this day has come up with the solution of what they actually were used for. They represent the triumphs after Petrarch. So there is the triumph of fame, the triumph of death, the triumph of love, and of course, the triumph of fate. Um, but no one knows what they were used for. They were already in Lorenzo de' Medici possessions because they are listed in his inventories. And up to this day, they have, they have been somehow halfway displayed in various parts of the museum. So because we don't know what they were used for, we decided to highlight their uniqueness and devote a room to Scheggia and to panel paintings in Florence and to the Cassoni, which were painted by Scheggia, but also by other artists. And they were a very important part of private living in Florence. So we really wanted to highlight their use, their beauty, and their unique value. The other peculiar part of the collection is laces. Now, you would never think that Palazzo d'Avanzati would have the second for importance collection in public hands. The first one is Paul di Pezzoli, which is a civic museum, and then it's Palazzo d'Avanzati. And Volpi had not interest in lace. So it all happened because in the late 1970s, Maria Fossi Todoro, who was the director of Palazzo d'Avanzati, decided that it was a good place where it could have been developed, the study, preserving, and display of laces. So thanks to the assembling of donations, important gifts that had gone to the Museo Nazionale del Bargello, she created a very wide ranging and unique collection of laces that has more than 2000 pieces. We didn't display them all, but <laughs> we had to find a good way to store laces and display the most important ones. For this, Daniele Rapino had the incredible eye of Mari mm, Marina Carmignani, who is one of the few specialists of Italian laces, and Elisa Zonta, who, who was the restorer, who literally worked for six months to preserve each and every fragment. And we had to create a double function. So you have this part with some vitrines that this, with display of the most refined objects. And here in the background, I decided on purpose not to bring details so that hopefully you'll go and see the things by yourself. Um, it's a series of almost a hundred drawings that the Bargello acquired four years ago now at an auction in Milan, which are very comprehensive of needlework and, and design making um, in 17th century. Then you have a series of, of um, uh, drawings where you can actually see the drawers, sorry, where you can actually see uh, the legal, um, my English is getting rusty, <laughs> uh, a series of drawers where you can actually see the laces in, in each one. So they have a double purpose. They are for display, but they are also for preserving. And in the center, there is this kind of like strange box that was envisaged by the architect, Lorenzo Greppi, to highlight children, baby um, outfit, where, they were, where there was the christening. And again, it's a combination of multifunctional work. And of this, I'm especially proud because conserving, preserving, rotating, is a very expensive affair. And for something that is not as easily accessible as blockbusters artists. It's not Donatello, it's not 
Bernini, it's not Michelangelo. And yet it's something that we need to preserve and we need to make people understand so that other, other younger generation can carry on studying. And the, set, the other part has a very peculiar small exhibition devoted to leisure of women between the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century in their different roles when they were getting married, when they became uh, mothers and what they were using and how they were dressing. And it was a relatively new uh, idea because as you know, for many century, underwear was no differentiated by sex. They all were the same things. Some details, which I, um, I'm showing you just to give you a span of this wide ranging collection. This is Italian and is 16th, 17th century. Some American and British samplers, because what happened is that it became such a vibrant study, center study for needlework, um, embroidery and laces that we received many uh, donations over time, not only of Italian, but also British American to the point that in the last year I had to say no thank you because sometimes we already had some parts of it and address people to other museums who could benefit from the collection. And this we are very proud of because when we arrived, um, most of the drawers in the previous insta display were wooden. So it means that they were not up to museology standards and it was uh, a fire hazard. And this was one of the reasons why we seek money from the ministry. These are of course fireproof, but the designer, the curator and the restorer came up with this ingenious idea. So in the drawers, there are little trays so that if scholars come or we need to rotate the exhibit, they can easily be taken out, replaced and moved in. So it was a very efficient, economic and you'll judge, but I think elegant way of displaying this very peculiar collection. We not only have Italian, so I'm showing you a beautiful piece of French lace of 18, late 18th and 19th century. Um, and this, there is this idea that people can really discover by themselves how the fashion evolved in this very peculiar. And there is also a very nice way of discussing technique. And the other thing is we decided to limit the sort of like technology to the minimum. So we will have some core code with the new website, but we decided that people should really step back and travel to time with us, take the steps, take the elevator, discover each and every object. I only gave you a few highlights, but it actually they reinstall 2000 square feet and four and 1500 objects that were all conserved, had new labels. And we, I have to thank the British Institute also because they provided a fabulous and patient translator that we could rely on uh, because it was not easy to deal with such a different and confusing materials. And in the end, when we reopened our doors last September, people were mostly pleased and surprised by finding very familiar objects, either in a new context or in the old context, but in dialogue with new ones. And this is what museums should do, be a never ending story of juxtaposition and narrative. So I like to hand with this beautiful image that shows the uniqueness of one of the most outstanding architecture of the medieval times that I have seen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Paula. And as always, we'll now open it up for questions. Um, I'll see if I can get the chat up. So the rules are the same as always. If you're in the room and want to ask a question, you just put up your hand and I'll talk to you. Um, if you're on the Zoom, you can put it up 
uh, on the chat, which I can read here, or you can even unmute yourself and talk to us. So do we have anything in the room to start with? Any thoughts or questions? Whilst you're thinking about it, we've got something in the chat from Nancy. It says, in some rooms, there are rows of hooks high up on the walls. Would, these have been real would there have been real tapestries hung over the painted tapestries, maybe only in winter for warmth? Also, would there have been rugs on the floors in winter? So the answer is yes to both. Um, there, we have some tapestries in some of the room's hangings to evoke what the hooks were used for. And rugs, yes, there were, it depends according to centuries because not uh, in every century and every owner could have afforded rugs. So tapestries were definitely used uh, or textiles. So for many, for many years, people wonder whether the Guicciardini quilt was on the bed or it was actually one of the textiles used for warmth in winter. Did the Guicciardini actually live in Palazzo Davanzato? No, no, they didn't. And, uh, and the quilt uh, comes not from the, your neighbors, but from another villa. But the Guicciarde, which is the coat of arms of the Guicciardini family, are widely present in the quilt. So that's why it was made on commission for the Florentine family. So um, I, I'm open for questions in the room. We got one here at the front row. Well, thank you, first of all. Um, I very recently revisited Palazzo d'Avanzati, the heads after the previous visit. When I got to the kitchen, I asked myself, why on the third floor? Is, is, isn't it strange? Well, the, the explanation, and it's the same question that I asked myself because I never, <laughs> before, before being the director, I never asked, but apparently it was very common because fires were very common in Florence. So the reason to, for putting the kitchen on the top was to avoid that fire would spread throughout the building. Also the staircase, the first floor is the steps are in stone, but then you have a wooden staircase that climbs up. And the reason why it was made of wood was that in case of assault, they could um, cut the staircase and, and leave enemies on the first floor. Thank you. Um, before we go for more questions, I'm going to ask Sarah to put up the uh, link to the donation site for the Zoomers. Um, we're very, very grateful to the people who Zoom in and give donations, and you're all, they're always welcome. Thank you. Um, so um, I've actually got a question which I wanted to ask. On the outside of the Palazzo, there's, um, there's very characteristic um, rails uh, across the building on, on the upper floors, which you see in very often in fresco representations of mm -hmm. Florence back in the I just wondered what, what their functionality was with this, all of that. I think it was again for hanging out um, textiles and, and heraldry coats, and it was used for hangings. And it was not on the first floor, but it's up above. Display, not, not the washing. No, display, display. <laughs> they didn't do much washing in the middle. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. I visited um, Palazzo Davanzati several years ago. Now, now I've definitely got to go again. Good. Um, you can join us on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> something that I think I might have read at the time, looking at the outside of the building, um, along the, the street, there are um, curvy doors or yes. gateways. And I seem to remember being told or reading that there used to be shops there at some point. Is, is that right? And yes. How long did they continue to have? Um, That's a very interesting, good question because there were shops and the little medi the little alley that I pointed you to with the gate was also a shop in a late 19th century image and had been walled up the, the alley with a sort of like a ceiling. They were shops and they were also, they were running, I would say, until the late 19th century. And at some point, there was also a magazine that was produced in the shops in the loggia. 
So this is also one of the reasons why people were so eager to preserve the building as it was. So when, when Volpi took up the conservation, he decided to open up the different shops. And when you walk in, you have a beautiful open loggia, uh, which, we, what, which is where we give our conferences and uh, gives the sense of the arriving through the, the house before the courtyard. And uh, on the first floor, there are some little wells, which seem well, but they are not wells, but they were used to pour down boiling oil in case of assault. So when it was still a lodge, in case um, people would have tried to assault the tower house, they would have been dissuaded by in, in that way too. But imagine that the uh, uh, land register, the catasto, was set up there in 1427. So it's really a combination of trade and living from the 16th century, from the 15th century onwards. Thank you. Some more coming in on the Zoom, on the chat. Um, so yeah, from Christine Wilding, that was interesting. I can't wait to come back and revisit. Is there any connection between the subject matter on, of the Guicciardini quilt and the French theme of the fresco as French poetry was a common theme in Sicily? No, French poetry was not a common thing in Sicily. That's the answer. And that's why we, we invited a Romance philologist to come again and talk about the Guicciardini quilt, because what is still unclear to art historians and to philologists is the connection between Tristan and Isolde and the fact that the translation of Tristan and Isolde was done in Florence. So probably it was through the Guicciardini family that Tristan and Isolde arrived in Sicily, but then with the translation in Bulgare, they retranslated it into Sicilian. And what is also peculiar is that they are not citations, but they are like Blur blurbs of the cartoon, so it's a summary. It's literally like reading a cartoon strips with the different stories. So the, the other mystery is that the connection with the people who do the embroidery and the Sicilian art, because they were definitely made in Sicily, but the author of the cartoons has yet to be identified. Then I don't know if on Saturday we'll find out more. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you <laughs> if we do. Paolo, you've got some feedback from one of your colleagues. Rapino D says, thank you. Oh, sir. He's, he's the curator. <laughs> right, well, thank you to Paolo <laughs> so for explaining it uh, so well, the rearranged work and all the, and that I and all the staff at the Bargello Museums have produced. Thanks to Paolo herself for having promoted and shared this project. There you go. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> of course, I am here, but I represent many people, and they have all done a great job in this, uh, together with um, Mar Marina Carmignani. Daniele had two different people working with him, well, many different people. Sonia Iacomoni, who still works there, but it's good that he wrote, because I forgot to mention, and I wanted to, the fact that during the reinstallation of Palazzo d'Avanzati, we also had uh, a young scholar who got uh, an internship, a paid internship by the Ministry of Culture. She got an internship um, overcoming different candidates and her name is Giulia Cantoni. She is, I believe, 25 or 26 years old. She worked on the reinstallation of Davanzati and the wonderful thing is that at the end of her internship, she got a job as museum curator in one of the museums in Tuscany and a very experienced um, art historian, Gioia Romagnoli, who also worked uh, on the reinstallation. And this is to say that we, we are a small team, but as you can tell, we are very determined. <laughs> I, I know the feeling. <laughs> I'm glad you all got that, 
Is it not anymore? Because if not, we might have reached a natural conclusion as we, as we well, say. The, the commiseration. <laughs> it's better than many, but not so good. Ah, just <laughs> Okay. See. <laughs> right, so um, have we got any more? Many more? Yes, we've got one in the back. Two in the back. It's lots more. We haven't reached the end at all. Chris. Yeah, hi, Paula. Hi. hi. In the 2016 sale, there was a panel. Um, I'm not too sure whether it was listed as Donatello, but it was in the market a few years ago. Um, you mentioned that a number of pieces that were sold from that sale were forgeries. I don't know whether you remember or recognize it, it was a mother and child panel. Um, and uh, assuming that the- As Donatello. It was so it was in the market as by Donatello. Yeah. So I don't know whether you recognize that by memory. Um, and if so, whether or not it's possible that it was a forgery or, or original. I don't remember the, the piece. I'm sorry. Um, but I'm happy if you want to look at a photograph afterwards. Uh, if you or if you tell me when it were, where it was and I'll go and look up at the photograph. Yeah, I've got a picture of it on my phone. Actually. Oh, good. <laughs> Right. Uh, but um, I, I, I think that in terms of panel paintings and objects, uh, leaving aside Alceo do Sena, most of the artworks were true masterpieces, like Membling, the diptych that is now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, was um, up for sale in the Volpi sale. And Roberta Terrazza, whom I mentioned, uh, wrote a very good book on that, devoting a lot of attention to the sale. And also Patrizia Capellini, they studied and traced where all the objects ended up. So, and they are traced most of them. So I'll be very happy to look at that photo. And for, for those who want to follow that theme a bit further, next sometime next month, we've got Lynn Carlson coming back, emerging from the Bardini archive with more of her research on what was uh, original what was manufactured from the Bardini dealing. So uh, more, plenty more of that coming. Uh, we've got more question here. Hi, I have two questions. Uh, one was, uh, did anything wind up in the Pierpont Morgan from the 1916 sale? Uh, I believe so. I believe so. You have to check the Ferrazza book, but I think that yes, the answer is yes. Also, there were Paints and tents of chairs, like the Savonarola chairs and wooden chambers. So I'm pretty sure that he did acquire something. A lot ended up in Detroit. And the building itself, uh, when there was the Jewish ghetto, was anything ever talked about that? Uh, not that we know of from the documents. Um, the the Davizi sold the building and from 1578 it was the Davanzati possessions and they lived there until 1838. In fact the big coat of arms that you see on the facade was um, by the Davids is by the Davizi family and in 1838 the loss of the Davi Davanzati family members committed suicide jumping off the staircase. We also have a bit of a drama. So in the end, that's why the palazzo started its decline because somehow the, the heirs sold it and trade began and there were shops, but the top floors were abandoned. Is there a, uh, a want for the community to no, not that we... They had sold it, they right. had destroyed. Yes, no, they had. Yes, that's the letters that I that I cited at the beginning. Vernon Lee, because she was a woman, she had to use a, a different name, but she published a letter in 1898 saying, You have to save Palazzo Davanzati. And again, both in the Ferrazza book and Patrizia Capellini had the names of all the people who. Anglo-American who contributed to saving the Palazzo d'Avanzati and had different claims. 
by no coincidence, we actually here in our archive have quite a lot of Vernon newspapers. So, oh, so maybe um, we should. Yeah, if somebody wants to come and yeah. <laughs> have a day or two poking around, you might find some more in there. Um, that's all good. Um, I see that Rapino. Oh, so, see you. Hi, Rapino. <laughs> Wave first. We can, see, we, can, we can all see the Zoomers who are on the video. We can see you. So you can wave at you and we can see you. Uh, and if you want to say anything, Rapino, you can just unmute and speak to us and we'll hear you. No? He's keeping quiet. <laughs> all right. Um, I think unless we've got any more, it's probably time to go next door to uh, enjoy some of the Festivaldi wines. Sorry, Zoomers, that we have, can't show you virtual wine, but I'm sure you can. Uh, Enjoy your glass at home. Um, okay. Lovely to see you all. Hi, Barbara. Nice to see you on the video. You're coming back here soon, I think. Looking forward to that. Fantastic. All right. And thanks, everyone, for joining us from all over the world and in the room. And thanks most of all to Father Christina from the Thank you. Thank you.